Now I'm recording. Yeah. Yes, when you tried to get back in, it said you had another meeting in progress. Uh, that's probably because when everything went blank, I pushed new meeting and I should have gone back to a different thing. I apologize. I'm not a techno savvy person and I don't see very well. So I might have pushed a button that did that. My sincere apologies. Barb is back. Okay, good, good. That's okay. I thought I did it. No, no. I thought, what did I do? I hit a button and I'm gone. <laughs> let's go back here and let's pick up where we left off. I guess I'm going to have to send two recordings. I don't know. We'll see. So he's, he's introduced the concept of chaos into the call of the disciples story, which is very mysterious. He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting nets, terminating in the sea because they were fishermen. Now, the Greek sense of this is that they're standing on the shore, casting nets, and the nets end up in the sea. That's going to become important as we go along. And, he, and Jesus said to them, come behind me, which is one of the two ways Jesus calls disciples, come behind me or go behind me. This word is ambiguous, come or go behind me. And I will make you become fishers of human beings. This is the Greek generic word for human beings. If he wanted to say men, he would have said androne. And if he wanted to say women, he would have said gonikon. But he says anthro anthropon. So it's, I will make you fishers of human beings. And immediately leaving their nets, they followed him. So here is one official way to call, come or go behind me, and the other one will be follow me. Okay, so we have our first successful call of disciples, Simon and Andrew. Okay. And notice that immediately leaving their nets, this is going to become theologically important, as I pointed out last class, because this is going to be the first action that disciples ever do and the last, except the next, uh, the last time they leave Jesus. And going along a little, he saw James of Zebedee, which would be son of Je Zebedee in English and John, his brother, and them in the boat, mending their nets. So the boat is propped up on the shore and they're mending their nets. So the first four people Jesus calls are fishermen and they stay on the shore. They're not shown in the sea, okay? A quick note, uh, Simon and James get first billing because they're the oldest. And that's why the others are identified as the brother of, okay? And immediately he called, this is the other way to become a disciple, them, and leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired hands, they went forth behind him. So he says, Come go forth behind me, <coughs> and Simon and Andrew follow. And then he says, come follow me, and, Simon, uh, and uh, James and John go behind him. So we now know that those phrases are interchangeable. And these are the first two successful calls of disciples, two sets of brothers. Any questions? And they came into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, notice how everything keeps happening immediately. Immediately on the Sabbath, he entering into the synagogue was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one having authority and not like the scribes. So before we go any further, do we like the scribes? No. No. 
Notice how left-handedly he introduces that. Jesus teaches as one having authority, not like the scribes. Okay. And the scribes would be the authorities in a synagogue because they could read the scriptures and then comment on them. Most people couldn't. And immediately again, there was in the, their synagogue, so this isn't his home synagogue, so he's not from this place, there was a human being having an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, what to us and to you, Jesus Nazarene, this is a Semitic idiom, what to me and to you is what business do we have between us? Okay. What to me and to what to us and to you, Jesus Nazarene, did you come to destroy us? And this is a very powerful word that Mark is going to use throughout mm -hmm. the gospel, mm -hmm. destroy. Um, did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him. Now, this is a this is a strong negative command, epitamao. It has at its basis that it's a challenge to someone's honor. So he rebukes it, the unclean spirit. Why? Because of the messianic secret. As soon as some demonic being or anybody else tries to say who Jesus is, he rebukes them and shuts them up. So the messiahship of Jesus is trying to keep from Mark's perspective, his messiahship secret, which is pretty historically accurate because people had to figure out he was the messiah over mm -hmm. time, right? So um, you are the Holy One of God. And he rebuked him, Jesus rebuked him saying, shush up and come forth from him. Now this word is what you, a superior uses to an inferior. So if a parent wanted to tell a disobedient child making noise, shut up, they would use this word. So notice from get-go, Jesus has authority and even unclean spirits he treats like misbehaving children. There is no parity between good and evil. Jesus is over all, okay? And convulsing mm -hmm. him, the spirit convulsing, the unclean spirit convulsing him and calling out in a loud voice or sound or shout. That's the problem with this word. We get phone from it in English like telephone. Uh, went forth from him, and they were amazed, all of them, so that they were asking to themselves, so this is an internal question, saying, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands, where's the verb there, he commands even the unclean spirits. Uh, someone's talking. Could you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, Excuse me. Okay. He commands even unclean spirits and they obey him. Now, anybody notice something peculiar about this story? He was teaching them as someone having, a, he was teaching them, he was teaching them as someone having the authority, and now they say a new teaching with authority. Notice how teaching and authority come up at the beginning and the end, that's a nice chiastic structure, at least the outside of it. What did Jesus teach here? He didn't say anything except Shut up and come out of it. And this is going to be Mark's primary means of teaching discipleship is by showing you what Jesus did. That's interesting. 
-hmm. if you if you put Mark up against the other three gospels, Mark has half as much teach it words of Jesus than Matthew and Luke and about one tenth as much as John. Mark teaches, Mark's Jesus, I should say, until chapter four, teaches almost exclu exclusively through showing. And this fits into the messianic theme too, because the messianic secret theme too, because he never comes out and says anything we can hold on to. He shows us who Jesus is. And one thing we know now, Jesus has control over unclean spirits. But we, we now know, we now go back. That's interesting. Remember he was going along, along the sea back in verse 15? Yes. 16, okay. He was going along, along the sea. This word para means right on the edge of the sea. So as opposed to the fishermen who are all staying on land, Jesus has no qualms about walking along the very edge of the sea. And this is going to be a theme throughout the gospel. Jesus has no fear of chaos. All human beings in this gospel have fear of the sea. Only Jesus doesn't have fear, fear of the sea. And as we'll see later, if you're on the sea with Jesus, fine. But if you're not on the sea with Jesus, chaos. Okay? Any questions before we go on? And immediately, see, Richard, everything's happening back to back to back to back to back. Coming out of the synagogue, they came to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So the houses weren't very big. It was pretty crowded there. And the mother-in-law of Simon was lying fiery or burning with fire. We'd say having a fever. Okay, and immediately they speak to him about her. And going forth, he raised her, grasping her hand, and the fever left her immediately. The fieriness left her immediately. Okay, we're going to stop there for a second. Coming forth to her, he raised her, grasping her hand. What did Jesus just do? He violated Mosaic law. Because according to Mosaic law, people who are noticeably sick are unclean. And you are not supposed to touch an unclean person. But Jesus violates Mosaic law. He, he, grasping her hand, he grasped her hand and the fever left her, okay? So this is going to be a consistent theme throughout the whole gospel. When Jesus heals, he first establishes physical contact with the person who is unclean. So he violates Mosaic law. Then he heals them of their disease. Now, being unclean, remember, the Romans allowed the local people to govern by their own laws. So their, the law of the land is Mosaic law, unless you're a Roman citizen, and then you're covered by Roman law. The law of the land is Mosaic law. Jesus. So if you are sick and unclean, you are technically excommunicated from the community of Israel. Technically. Okay, 
So what does Jesus do before he heals the person? He welcomes them back into community. Mm. So the first thing is always a social healing, which is also a religious healing, and then a physical healing. Okay? The only time he doesn't touch somebody is when he is doing a distant miracle, but... We will see if Mark even manages to allow touch when he's far away, okay? And what is her response to being healed? She ministers to him. So now Jesus has angels ministering to him and Simon's mother-in-law, a woman ministering to him. This is, he's gonna keep building this, so keep this in mind. Any questions about that story? Yeah, how it's not about this story particularly, but I never realized or knew that touching a sick person was against Mosaic law. So how would anyone else try to heal that person or well, feed that person? Well, first of all, the... Women in this culture were almost perennially unclean mm. because blood was a sign of uncleanliness. And as soon as the, the, the girls hit puberty, there was blood every month. And that was unclean. So since women already were unclean, the dirty work fell, uh, the unclean work fell to them. Now they were unclean for a part of the month, but then they had to uh, take care of sick people. That was their job that made them unclean. They also, uh, as we are going to see, prepared bodies because they're unclean. And all of these uncleanlinesses show up in the fact that in the temple, there was the court of the Levites, the priests, and then there was the court of men, which only clean people could enter. And then on the outside of that was the court of women where unclean people could go. Wow. Even in the synagogues, the men sat on benches in the synagogues and there was grill work along the walls and women stood outside because they were so often unclean. Thank you. I just thought it was because they were women. Well, no, well, <laughs> there were so many uncleanliness laws. If you ever have insomnia, go read um, Leviticus and and um, Deuteronomy, there, there are so many things that can make a human being unclean and they almost, well, they most frequently fall on women. I have a question. <clears throat> yes. Uh, when you say she ministered to him, what exactly does that entail? Well, in general, if a woman is doing it and it's not a situation of um, doing something unclean, they would she would be um, presenting his meal to him. She'd be waiting on him like a, a wait. Uh, the, the word diakonos meant waiter, diakone, a uh, female waiter, diakonos, a male waiter which is why deacons at mass wait on the table, right? I mean, they do other things, but they do service at, at mass or in the sacraments, they perform a service. So she's probably serving them because when there was company, the men would eat separate from the women. 
just like today in some Muslim countries, if, if, if you have anybody but a family member in the house, the men and women ate separately. The women would serve the man, and after the men were fed, they would go and eat. Okay? Okay, thank you. I just thought maybe it meant like spiritually somehow. I I wasn't sure. Well, no, like, this is this is context. In the in in the gospel, this is always grunt work. Grunt work. Got it. <laughs> Good to know. In fact, he's going to use this to devastating effect in the way section. Okay. Grunt work. Okay. Thank you. Now, at this point, people would be either stomping their feet or banging their knuckles on the table because um, storytelling was very interactive in the first century and they showed appreciation for what just happened by banging their knuckles on the table or stomping their feet. If they didn't like it, they would hiss. So Mark's telling a story, so he's got to get the people back in the mood and stop all of the yay, Jesus triumphs, uh, banging noises. So he says, when evening happened, when the sun was setting, I mean, when the sun set, those are the same meaning, but what does it do? He says, when evening happened, they, sh they stopped making their noise. So he has to repeat slightly differently when the sun set, which is the same thing, even ha evening happens when the sun sets by definition in this culture. Um, so this is another, uh, well, one of many examples we're gonna see of why I think this was performed before it was written down. They brought to him all the ones having illy, which is how they say being sick, and the demon possessed. And the whole town was gathered at the gate or the door, since I assume that they're fishermen and they don't have a courtyard, this would be the door, but it's the same word in Greek. It's the same word in English too. We, we use the same root for that word, door, Thor, okay. And he, he cured many, having having illnesses, um, having various illnesses, with um, having illnesses with various disease or being sick with various diseases to low redundant. And he cast out many demons and he did not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. So here again, we have the messianic secret. He wouldn't permit them to speak because they knew him. Paul, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, you know, it, he mentions demons so casually. What, what, was this part of the way people understood strange actions by those around them in that period? This oh, yeah. Um, especially since Mark is writing um, for a rural community, as we will see. Um, he's composing for a rural community. They would... Um, they would recognize diseases, but they would they would attribute almost anything having to do with what we call today demonic possession, mental illness, demonic possession. They would also attribute demonic possession to diseases that cause you to jerk involuntarily or to speak out uncontrollably. All of that would be attributed to demons. When you get to Luke's gospel, which is written for a city congregation, lots of these demons get transferred into diseases. Ah, interesting. But for, but for Mark, we, ha we have physical ailments and demonic possession. And these, are, these two distinctions are going to become very important because In the culture of the day, they thought that illnesses were punishments for sin, whereas demonic possession was you were just sitting there and something took you over. So there's two different mechanisms for diseases and demonic possession. 
Thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to need that uh, probably before the end of class. So I just got it out a little bit early. Any other questions before we go on? In the morning, very early, rising, he went, uh, he, he go comes forth and goes forth into a deserted place and he was praying, okay? And Jesus frequently does prayer either right after or right before something big happens in this gospel. And Simon pursued him along with those with him. So Simon is already the, the chief disciple. And they found him and they say to him, everyone is looking for you. Fair enough. And he says to them, let's go elsewhere into the surrounding towns in order that there also I may proclaim, because for this I came forth. So from Jesus's perspective, what is his primary job proclaiming? And yet here we are close to the end of chapter one and he hasn't proclaimed anything yet. But from Jesus's perspective and Mark's, proclaiming is Jesus's first job. He can heal people, he can cast out demons, but his first priority is proclaiming. Okay? Any questions? Pro proclaiming meaning he was going into synagogues and teaching? Well, he's going into towns and villages. If it's the next day after he did all of this in the synagogue and with the mother-in-law and with the people of the town, people would probably not be in synagogues because it's it's uh, Sabbath day started at sunset, which is when you had your synagogue service. I guess they could, they would keep the synagogue open, but I, I, the way he the way Mark phrased it, it looks like he's going into the towns and villages. So he, he probably would go to the town gates, which is where anybody went who wanted to announce news or anything like that. But, the, but synagogues are a possibility. Any other questions? And he came proclaiming into synagogues, but we don't, this, you notice there's a paragraph mark here in Greek. The editors think that this is a summary statement. In other words, he was proclaiming. He did it in synagogues and in uh, the whole of Galilee and uh, casting out demons, proclaiming and casting out demons, proclaiming and casting out demons. And he comes, and there comes to him a leper, begging him and kneeling down and saying to him, if you wish, you are able to cleanse me. Okay. And this here is the most, the deepest positive emotion a human being can experience. And moved with compassion, extending his hand, he touched him and says to him, I do wish be made clean. And immediately the leprosy went forth from him. So notice, social healing, according to Mosaic law of a leper has to stand a stone's thrown away. And if you get any closer, he or she has to yell out leper. Okay. So he comes up to Jesus. So he breaks Mosaic law. 
Jesus touches him, he breaks Mosaic law, and he socially, religiously heals him before he physically heals him. Okay? And immediately the leprosy went forth from him and he was cleansed. And this word is the most negative human emotion and uh, in the gospel there are others that are consistently negative but this is becoming violently ang angry <clears throat> excuse me and becoming violently angry immediately he cast him out now that's what he's been doing with demons and unclean spirits. And he says to him, <clears throat> excuse me, I came prepared this week. I have my asthma sprite with me. Mm. he cast him out and he says to him look don't say nothing to nobody which you can do in Greek the more negatives the better it's like Spanish but go show yourself to the priest and offer concerning your cleansing what Moses commanded for testimony to them so when a leper was cured of leprosy, in other words, it wasn't progressing any longer, you had to present yourself to a priest who would, actually you had to do it twice, but you go show yourself to the priest, he says you are clean, and then you are unexcommunicated. So the priest is the one who lets you back into the community. Jesus, in this case, left him back, let him back into the community. But Jesus says, go follow the rules. Go do what Moses said to do. Because at this point, only Jesus has welcomed him back. The community is welcomed back through the priest. Okay? And the testimony to them will be his healing. That's the testimony. In other words, we saw it happen. That's the testimony. But coming forth, he began to proclaim at length and to sensationalize the account. Is this what Jesus said to do? No. So that no longer was he, was he uh, Jesus, able openly to enter into a town, but he was outside in the deserted places and they were coming to him from all sides or from everywhere. Now, Mark has done so many things in this story. We're going to be here a few minutes. First off, Jesus just told me that, uh, told us that his job from his perspective is to proclaim and the disobedience of this guy sensationalizing the account prevents Jesus from entering a town to proclaim. So notice, Jesus can walk right on the edge of the sea and not be afraid. He can cure diseases. He can cast out unclean spirits and demons, which are the same thing for Mark. Sometimes he starts with unclean spirits and he ends with demons. What can't he control? human beings. And if human beings disobey Jesus, human beings have the capacity to hinder him in his mission. This is the only gospel that says that out loud. If human beings don't do what they are told, they are able to actually hinder Jesus in doing what he came to do. That's an important point. 
which we'll need for the rest of the gospel. Next important point. Once when I was reading this story to my freshman class and I said, well, you know, Jesus is so deeply moved with compassion and then he's so violently angry. One of my students says, uh, this Jesus has mood swings and it certainly looks like it on the surface, but that's not what's going on underneath. Can anybody see what's going on underneath? You have several indications in this story. Jesus takes the place of sinners? No, it's nothing theological going on here, except what we've just discussed. It's out of chronological order. What is the correct chronological order for this story? Somebody comes to Jesus and says, if you wish you can heal me. He says, he touches him and he says, I do will it, wish it be made clean. Now look, go to the priest and do what Moses prescribed. He goes away and sensationalizes the account. Jesus is no longer able to enter into the towns, which is why he came forth. And Jesus is angry. That's the logical. How do I know that? Well, I'm going to cheat and tell you. I read the other Gospels that were, where the story is in correct chronological order. What is Mark doing here? He's scrambling the chronological order, and he's going to do this a lot in this gospel. Why is he doing that? What is his primary concern? That we change our mindset and believe in the gospel. Continue. Keep on changing our mindset and believe in the gospel. Everyone in this community has heard this story a zillion times before Mark puts it in the gospel, because they used to be told, on Sundays, randomly, they weren't in any order, but people would stand up and say, I have a story, and they would tell it, and traveling preachers would come through from time to time and say, here are 10 stories of Jesus, and they'd tell it. Everybody knew this story by heart. What does it do to scramble the chronological order? Think about it. Nobody? Is this the chaos? Well, this is certainly chaotic, but it's not uh, the primordial chaos that we're dealing with. No, if you've heard a story a zillion times, how do you hear it and change your mindset? You already know what it means, but Mark scrambles the chronological order that gets people to stop and say, wait a minute. In other words, this is a narrative technique for making you stop and reconsider to change your mindset. Okay. What's the problem? We hear the same, you know, I mean, I've been teaching the Gospels for almost 40 years. As soon as I hear a Gospel, I go, oh, that one, and I've got it figured out. And it's the priest's job to help me unfigure it out, right? Because the priest goes back and looks at the exegetical commentaries and through his own studies, he goes, okay, how am I going to present this in the homily in a way that they'll hear it new? Right? Yes. That's what Mark's doing. He's making us go, wait a minute. Something, something isn't right. We have to reconsider the story. We have to metanoeo in Greek. We have to look at it new, which is the basis of changing our mindset about the story. And so things, chronological order inside of pericopes is going to be a mess in this gospel, which is another reason Mark seems to be mysterious. Things don't happen the way they do in real life sometimes. You don't have these. Jesus does not have mood swings. Jesus has a very legitimate reaction to somebody messing up his ministry. Okay? 
But the important takeaway here is if you don't do what Jesus tells you to do, you as a human being have the potential to disrupt his ministry, what he's here to do. And Mark is going to beat this a little bit in this gospel, which tells me what? What does it tell you about Mark's community from Mark's perspective? They're not doing what Jesus said to do. You don't, you don't compose a gospel. You don't spend the fortune in writing down a gospel. I mean, writing this document down for the first time would cost in our terms between $250,000 and $400,000 between the paper, the ink, and the scribe. This is an incredibly expensive thing. Why would, you, why would you compose a whole gospel? Well, for lots of good reasons I talked about before, but why would you do it? To address the needs of your community. It's right there in Catholic documents. All of each gospel was written to address the needs of a particular community. So here it is. He's addressing the needs of his community. They need shaking up repentance, change of mindset, and they need to believe in the gospel. And so the story he's telling is shaking them up, doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Now, Paul? Yeah? Um, just, just a thought. I mean, uh, when you said that um, Jesus doesn't have control over human beings and we can really... Um, we shouldn't. We can interrupt his what, what he's trying to do. That that is to me that's real profound because we we hear all the time about God giving us free will. God chooses not to tell us what to do. Not that Jesus can't that Jesus can't control us. That's that's I've never heard that before. Okay, well, yeah, and uh, by the way, God through the scriptures is always telling us what to do and what not to do. It's just that Jesus is going to turn much of the scriptures on its head. Now, so far, he hasn't been teaching us a lot verbally, but he certainly is teaching teaching us what he can do, what he alone can do. But also, Mark is teaching his community, you have the potential to disrupt Jesus's ministry. And it's your fault if you do. And remember, everybody sitting in this congregation is a believer. He's shaking up the community. And in fact, all of the gospels shake up the community. I ran a, a Bible study for 10 years for the campus ministry people so they could go out and run Bible studies. And one day after about two years, one of the participants came to see me afterwards. And he says, I go to the scripture for consolation, but all you give me is a kick in the pants. I said, good. <laughs> There's a lot of consolation there, but it's always get your act together, change your mindset, believe properly, put it into action. I said that nobody wrote a gospel to make me feel good. They did it to help me be good, right? Mm. <clears throat> Any other questions before we go on? And entering again into Capernaum over a period of days, it was heard that, and I guess it's he entering because it's singular. <coughs> it was heard that he was in a house. Okay. And many gathered so that no longer was there room even at either the gate or the door, depending on how big, how wealthy the person was. And he was speaking to them the word. So we keep getting told he's teaching, he's speaking, but we're not hearing an awful lot yet. <coughs> uh, 
<laughs> now this sentence isn't grammatical in any language. So I'm going to do the best I can. And there came carrying to him a paralyzed one being carried by four. So in other words, some people came to him. The idea is that there's a group of people coming to him, four of whom are carrying someone, mm -hmm. okay? But, oh, Mark, please. Okay. <clears throat> and not being able to enter um, to Jesus because of the crowd, they unroofed the roof where he was and digging down. So what kind of a roof do we have here? We have a thatch roof with mud under it. So I know he's in the countryside, which is how why I think Mark's community is rural rather than urban, because in the cities they use tile roofs. And if you go to Luke's gospel, Luke says, and they removed the tiles. He fits it to his audience, just like Mark fits the story to his audience. They dig down and they lower <coughs> the mat on which the paralytic was lying. And this is another clue. In a city, they would use a litter. But here, these are poor people. They just have a rug that they're carrying him on. And Jesus, seeing their faith, all the people coming to him, the four carrying him, the man, says to the paralytic, child, your sins are forgiven. Now, this word child, we have three different words, child, in this gospel. This is the good one. Child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes sitting there were sitting there and discussing in their hearts. <coughs> Sorry, we're in the midst of a weather change. <clears throat> And um, and was saying in their hearts, what? Why does this one speak thus? He is blaspheming. Who is able to forgive sins except one God? Now, first of all, the first thing <clears throat> any human being in this society should think when Jesus says your sins are forgiven is that he is recognizing that God forgive, forgave the sins. Because everybody, everybody knows that only God can forgive sins. In fact, when the high priest on um, the day of, uh, day of Atonement says, your sins are forgiven, it is recognition that God has just forgiven the sins of the people. So they are going way out of their way to find fault with Jesus. But why are they going out of their way to find fault with Jesus? Because the man's paralysis in their culture, in their society, is obviously a sign that he's a sinner. So what Jesus is going to do very cleverly is use their false understanding of the cause of paralysis to teach him something new. And notice that they're discussing in their hearts. That's where you do your thinking in your heart. The deepest word of um, compassion Jesus had just is a compound of stir up and intestines because that's where you felt. Okay, so we're going to have to learn a little first century anatomy, I guess. Uh, you think with your heart and you, fe and you feel with your gut. 
and immediately recognizing in or by means of his spirit, it's ambiguous in Greek, that thus they are discussing inside themselves, he says to them, why are you discussing these things in your heart? So Jesus can actually read interior developments. I'm not saying he's a mind reader. He's a heart reader. How's that? <clears throat> what is easier to say? Number one, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or number two, say, rise, take up your mat, and walk. Well, obviously, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because you can't. There's nothing there unless the guy were to stand up. That's the only way these people would know that the man's sins are forgiven. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins upon the earth, he says to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your mat, and go to your house. And he rose, and immediately taking up his mat, he went forth before all of them. <clears throat> so what is Jesus using? He's using their failure to understand that disease is caused by other than sin to prove to them that he has authority to forgive sins as the son of man. Now, this is the first time we've met this, this title and it's a very mysterious title. We don't know a lot about it. Before Mark got his hands on it, it appears, I think, three times in the scriptures. And there it refers to a special human being. Or, in one case, to the whole Israelite nation. So Mark takes an expression that has very limited meaning. We also think that in Palestine, northern Palestine at the time, the Son of Man was the title given to the heavenly image of a human being. <clears throat> but our evidence for this is weak, but there's some evidence. In other words, when God wanted to create human beings, he thought of the perfect human being, and then we're all, we actual human beings, are all knockoffs. It's sort of like a printing press. You take the perfect human being, you press it into Adama, the dirt, and you get Adam, human being, out of it. So when Jesus uses this, it's highly ambiguous what he's trying to say. And Mark uses this title, which, by the way, is Mark's favorite, most used title for Jesus. Mark's fa favorite, Mark, uh, most used title for Jesus, because it's sufficiently ambiguous that he can fill it up with his own theological information. Okay. The Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth. Now, this is blasphemous for whoever the Son of Man, whoever claims to be the Son of Man, because God alone can forgive sins, which is another reason for Jesus to say, not to say, so that you may know that I have authority to forgive sins. He says that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Now, the audience all knows that Jesus is the Son of Man, but it's, again, keeping his identity secret. So now we know that Jesus can cure the sick, cast out demons and unclean spirits. He can walk right on the edge of the sea and not be afraid. And this ambiguous son of man character whom we we the audience know as Jesus has authority to forgive sins on the earth okay now 
Mark has been showing me a lot of stuff. Why? This is the first actual ironclad teaching that Jesus gives, and he makes it very mysterious. What is he allowing the audience to do by showing us rather than talking at us primarily? He's giving us an opportunity to re-experience the story of Jesus in a new way, showing us who Jesus is instead of telling us, so that this will foster a re-evaluation, a metanoia of who Jesus is, what he came to teach us, what our response needs to be. Okay? Does that make sense? And he rose immediately taking up his mat. He went forth before all of them so that all of them, and this is a great word, it means to stand outside of yourself. We'd say, well, out, are out of their mind. They were out of their minds, all of them. And they were glorifying God saying, we have never seen thus. Okay. We have never seen anything like this. And glorifying God is the correct response. But in glorifying God, who did the healing and the forgiveness of sins? Jesus. So the proper response to what Jesus does is to glorify God. But since glory belongs to God, it says a lot about Jesus, right? And Mark's going to make a very big distinction here because he's, later on we're going to find out that some people are casting out demons using Jesus's name. So it's still Jesus is the one doing it. They can't do it without using Jesus's name. <clears throat> so we know at this point that Jesus has the face, ways, and paths of God. He can do what only God can do like forgive sins. What's Mark teaching us piece by piece? There's no doubt that Jesus is a human being. He has human emotions. He prays to God. But he can do what only God can do. <clears throat> now, it's going to be a few cent centuries before we come up with our creeds, but it's already here in Mark. Jesus has what God has and can do what God can do. Divine. He's perfectly a human being. He eats, he drinks, he sleeps, he does, you know. So even though it took us a few hundred years to put all of this down in philosophically worded creeds, it's already here. Any questions? Now, I have one question for you, and this is going to be a vote. We sort of lost three minutes, and I can do one more pericope in six minutes. Do you want to go on, or do you want to stop here? Go on. Let's go on. Go on. Okay, one more, one more. Yeah. And he went forth again along the sea, along the sea people, and all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them and going along what's going to happen next we already know when jesus goes along along the sea and he sees someone what does he do next we saw it in chapter 1 verse 16 he calls a disciple and going along, he saw Levi of Alphaeus, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the uh, tax place. It's, it's, um, it's not really a booth. It's sort of like a table. And he says to him, follow me 
and he followed him. Now, this is the third successful call of disciples. There will never be another disciple called successfully in this gospel. But notice what else has Mark done in here? He trained us in verse 16 of chapter one to recognize, follow along, along, and the sea, follow along, along the sea, and then he sees somebody and then he calls them. He did it twice before, and this is the third time. If we figured that out for ourselves, what does that accomplish? Think about it. If Mark, I told you there was nothing theological about it, scriptural about walking along along the sea. There's nothing scriptural about that. But it was odd enough that people would notice it and remember it because it was redundant. And he does it twice. And then here he does it for the third and last time. What is the impact on the congregation if they hear go along along the sea and he saw and if they thought, oh, he's going to call a disciple? What is the rhetorical impact of that? Think about it. Think about the books that you read. I'm a big sci-fi fan, but if you read mysteries or something, what happens when you're given all the evidence and you figure it out for yourself? What does that do besides make you feel smart? You, you, you learn Jesus' technique for seeking out people. You do do that, but I'm talking about the process of you recognizing Mark is presenting another call. He's going to present another call story. Think about that, that moment when you go, oh, he's going to make another call story. So you learn what to expect. Well, you learn what to expect, but when you learn what to expect and then it, you recognize it even before it happens. Okay, nobody's going there. I'll just say it. At that moment, Mark is your best friend because he taught you something clever and it's now something you share between the two of you. This is a rhetorical technique to build the audience's trust in the author, not Jesus, but the author. Why is that valuable? Because this is a document, uh, a story that is uh, the gospel is challenging the people in Mark's community. He's using all sorts of simple rhetorical techniques to get you on his side because he's soon enough going to start challenging you because he's going to start soon enough to make the disciples look bad. And of course, we think of ourselves as disciples. So he's going to build up a rapport with the audience before he starts to challenge the disciples in the story who are our representatives in the story. Because if you think about it, if this is being performed before you or read before you, every time Jesus says, Mark says, Jesus said to his disciples, do this, who do we, the audience, hear it as? He's talking to us because we're his disciples. Yeah. You see how that works? And this is just one of the zillions of tiny little things that authors can do. And one of the many ways that Mark gets you comfortable enough to trust Mark so that when he starts dropping the boom on your head, you go, well, maybe I should consider that, right? I always tell my students, um, I, there are two ways I walk into class the day after a, te a test. I either start off with, you all really did fine work, congratulations. Or I start off with, I could see that you worked hard on this, but. <laughs> 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 what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get them on my side before I give them the bad news, right? Right. <laughs> I could tell you really worked hard on this. I'm thinking in my head, if you opened the book, it was straightforward, but you know, okay. 
So Mark is using, he's, he's a storyteller. He's using story techniques, okay? Now, I don't know if I'm gonna have to send out two different tapes for this class. So the short one is the first part and the long one is the second part. I'll send a note to Father Tom who sends it out and saying it got disrupted in the middle and I restarted it, but you know, I'll, I'll explain it to him. I'm always around for 15 minutes before class starts so you can ask questions. You don't even have to ask Mark, uh, you know, profound Mark questions. Because if you do ask a profound Mark question, I'm going to say save it for class. But, you know, we can just <laughs> talk beforehand, okay? Okay, so have a great week, and I'll see you next week. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. Great Thank class. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor.